Welcome to AP Environmental Science. In this video, we are going to talk a little bit about invasive species and endangered species. So the main concepts that you should be able to do by the end of this video is explain the environmental problems associated with invasive species and a few strategies used to control those invasive species. You should also be able to explain how species can become endangered and some strategies that can be used to help prevent species from becoming endangered or to help endangered species recover. Now invasive species are things that can live and often thrive outside of their normal habitat range. Now, some invasive species are considered good, but typically an invasive species is going to take over the habitat that would be available to the native species and they're able to outcompete that native species because the invasive does not have any natural predators in that environment. So let's look at a couple examples here. The first one is garlic mustard and just to give you a sense of scale that is a normal size human adult next to a patch of mustard and it gets quite tall. Each of those flowers on the top is going to produce quite a few seeds in the realm of land management in terms of invasive species control. Garlic mustard is often referred to as job security because it takes many generations of the plant in that particular area of constant eradication control before that small population gets reduced down. Now this originated in Europe and parts of Asia and was purposefully introduced to North America in the Northeast and Midwest. Um, and it was introduced for medicinal purposes and as a food source. Another example here is Eurasian water milfoil. Now this is a fully aquatic plant. Again, originated in Europe and parts of Asia. And this is believed to have been introduced in the aquarium trade or from the transport of watercraft. So if you do not spray off your boat in between lakes, you could potentially be transporting small little pieces of this Eurasian water milfoil or other invasive aquatic plants between lakes and that can act as a vector for the spread of these invasive species. Now the reason why Eurasian water milfoil is bad and so aggressive here is that it can propagate or reproduce just from a tiny little piece of the plant attaching to a boat getting entered into another waterway and that can then proliferate in that new water body. And these grow so dense that it actually prevents sunlight from reaching the bottom and it blocks out that sunlight from the native plants. Another one that is invasive, this would be the silver carp. Now the silver carp originated in Eastern Asia and was originally introduced on purpose for aquaculture and phytoplankton control. Now uh, this kind of got out of hand and started to invade lakes and rivers and this outcompetes the native fish species for food and also is quite dangerous to boaters because these are the fish that will jump out of the water um, and are kind of like flying fish so to speak. And then of course we have the emerald ash borer. Now the emerald ash borer is a relatively small in insect, but they are a bright, shiny emerald green. These originated in eastern Russia, northern China, Japan, and Korea, and were accidentally introduced into the United States back in 2002, which is relatively recent considering that these have very rapidly spread across most of the United States and has really decimated the ash tree population in the United States, who do not have the ability to withstand these insects. And there are not natural predators to these insects that live in the United States. So what happens is the ash borer, the adult, lays its eggs just under the bark of a tree, and then the eggs will hatch, and the larva will bore little tunnels 
through the fleshy layer just under the bark, and that will essentially suffocate the tree. Once the larvae are ready to emerge, they push their way out, and that is what you will see the bark kind of peeling off of the ash tree. Usually by the time you see that bark peeling off, it's already too late to save the tree. And these trees that are infested are typically going to die within three to four years of that infestation beginning. Now there are some characteristics of invasive species. Most invasive species are generalists. Remember a generalist is a species that can live in a wide variety of habitat. These are also frequently our strategist species, meaning that they are going to have a whole lot of offspring and probably not provide a lot of parental care. Typically, these are going to exhibit a type 3 survivorship curve. And the main point of an invasive species here is that it's going to outcompete that native species for resources. Now I included this diagram on here because I think it's interesting to really analyze the way that we perceive and view and pay attention to these invasive species. Oftentimes, by the time that people become aware of this problem, it's already going to be an uphill battle to really control this particular invasive species. So once that invasive is detected, it usually takes a little bit before word gets out and land managers become aware of this problem. And at that point, it's still possible to get rid of the invasive species. But by the time you get the public on board to help as well, typically it's now becoming very unlikely to be able to completely eradicate it. And we're focusing our uh, we're shifting our focus more towards controlling that population and that local management. Now, this is not to say that all hope is lost. This is mostly just to say that these invasive species spread so rapidly that it takes a very focused effort to get on top of things right away. Now, endangered species are any species that is in danger of extinction. Now, extinction means that there are no more individuals left living anywhere on the world. And this flowchart helps to evaluate how we determine the threat level for in endangered species. And this is similar to what the IUCN uses to make what's called the red list. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Now, within Wisconsin, there are some endangered species that you should know. The first is the peregrine falcon. We also have the ornate box turtle and the American martin. Now these are very endangered. There's very few of them left. And if you do happen to see one in the wild, count yourself as lucky, give the animal its space and try to keep other people from disturbing that area. Now we also have threatened species. Threatened means that they're kind of on the way towards endangered status, but they're not quite as low of a population yet. So we have the big brown bat and the little brown brat, and we also have the great egret. Those are threatened species in the state of Wisconsin. Now, when we look worldwide, I really like this image because each pixel in the image represents one individual that's remaining in the wild. So you can see the more distorted the image, that means the fewer there are. So we have the Bengal tiger, the eastern lowland gorilla, the green sea turtle, the black rhino, giant panda, and the Galapagos penguin, all of which are pretty severely endangered. So some of the factors that lead to a species becoming endangered include extensive hunting or overhunting or overharvesting. This comp competition with invasive species, with their individuals for that space, for the food, for that habitat, and having a very narrow or limited diet or very limited or narrow habitat requirements. So some species that have these characteristics would be the giant panda and the koala, both of which have very narrow diet restrictions and only live in very narrow habitat ranges. Now keep in mind, not all species are going to be endangered of in danger of extinction when they're exposed to these same pressures. So some species that have a little bit more genetic diversity are better able to adapt to these changes in their environment and are less likely to face extinction. 
But if you already have a very small population and you're facing these extra pressures, that can lead to extinction. But there are things we can do to help protect these populations. The first thing is criminalize poaching and protecting those animal habitats. Those are kind of our big pieces, along with proposing legislation to really enforce those first two parts and helping educate and transition the local human population in those areas to help them see that protecting these animals is going to provide a greater economic viability than poaching these animals or destroying that habitat. Now, in terms of the legislation, there are two pieces that you need to know. The first is called CITES, or the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora. Now, this pops up on the AP exam every year. This is an international agreement, and it created what's known as the Red List. Now, the Red List is a list of species that are threatened or endangered, and these species that are on the Red List are given this international protection. So wherever you are in the world, if you are found with any animal parts or any paraphernalia from these animals, you are now in serious trouble. Um, and this has allowed all of these countries to work together to monitor the import and export of the animals on that list. Now within the United States, we have designated the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to really implement this particular um, agreement within our country. Other countries have their own um, similar entity like the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that really implements the program in their own country. The U.S. also has the Endangered Species Act. Again, this is regulated by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And this is what really requires federal agencies to make sure that whatever it is that they are doing is not going to impact the existence of any species that is on that red list or that action is not going to impact the habitat of those species. So you cannot do any type of taking or hunting, killing, trapping, etc., of any endangered fish or wildlife but you can also not import, export, transport across state lines, et cetera, of any of the listed species either. So if there's federal money or a federal agency doing something, they cannot be impacting these endangered and threatened species. Now there has been a lot of progress made because of this bits of legislation and these policies. For example, the giant panda is no longer listed as endangered. They've been upgraded to vulnerable, still not doing great, but we've seen this increase in their population. Now, things to keep in mind, the range or the habitat that's available for them to live in is still quite small and their habitat is still under threat. So although we've increased their numbers, it still looks pretty bleak for them. The whooping crane is another success story. You can see the grade area is their native range of where they used to be found, but today they're not really found in any of that. Uh, there are two migrating populations of whooping crane, one here in Wisconsin and another up in Canada. And within the whooping crane population in Wisconsin, there have been a lot of efforts to help hatch and raise these baby cranes and then take them on their first migration and they follow this small little plane, uh, the single engine little plane to guide them down to the Kissimmee Prairie down in Florida. Now in summary, you should be able to explain environmental problems associated with invasive species, a few of the strategies to control them, and you should be able to explain how some species become endangered along with strategies to combat the problem. On this slide, I have a few of my favorite endangered species. The armadillo looking guide is actually a pangolin. Then we have a snow leopard and of course, my favorite little teddy bear of an animal, which is the red panda. Please leave me your questions here at the end and I hope that as you watch this video, you were able to learn something.